Welcome to part two of the Splatoon Iceberg. Today we are going to be going over the shallow and deep end of the iceberg. Let's waste no time and get right into it. First up on the shallow end is the Octarian Power Crisis. And this is really inferred from the fact that the Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2 base campaign is all about getting back the Great Zapfish, which kind of implies that since this is Agopolis' main source of power, the Octarians are trying to steal it due to a power crisis of their own to fuel their military complex and their overall society. Next is rival Octolings are controlled by DJ Octavio, and this is probably more likely than unlikely due to seeing Callie's shades in the end of the Splatoon 1 base campaign are the things that are controlling her throughout the whole campaign, and seeing that the Octolings that are your rivals in Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2 wear similar things, yeah, it's probably more likely than not that they are all mind controlled, and maybe that's why they need the Great Zapfish is to power the mind control glasses. Pearl's hidden shockwave ability refers to the fact that when Pearl was young, she destroyed a folk youth singing competition with her voice. It was so powerful that she ended up just hiding it away until we see it in Octo Expansion when she channels it into the Killer Whale. Hidden Sea Cucumbers is about how in Splatoon 2 Octo Expansion, sometimes in certain levels there will be just sea cucumbers, like our sea cucumber who helps us through the campaign just scattered across the maps. There's not much to this one I don't think. Number 007 EDC versus Number E1A307 refers to an unused ink combination of a light blue versus a yellow, the light blue being the alpha team and the yellow being the bravo team. I can't actually find pictures of the colors. Callie and Marie's family refers to the fact that the only one we know related to Callie and Marie is Captain Cuttlefish being both of their grandfather whereas Callie and Marie are cousins. If you didn't know this already, they are not actually sisters. Marina's landlord is a narwhal, refers to when Marina said in the second to last official Splatfest that her landlord is a narwhal when choosing Team Narwhal. There isn't really much to this one, and why this one's so low, I don't really understand. Jellyfish are second class citizens, refers to the fact that jellyfish don't really participate in anything related to uh, turf war or ranked battle. I don't think this is actually true because we see them all the time doing other things like shopping or rope climbing. There's not really much to back this one up, so this one's probably not true. So this one's actually pretty funny. So. Hackers in a Rank X leaderboard is when a group of players who were pissed off about there not being a good anti-cheat in Splatoon 2 changed their names to please add anti-cheat and cheated their way up to the top 1% to get onto the Nintendo Switch app. They changed their names to please add anti-cheat and everyone who looked at it saw that. So Nintendo definitely had to see at that point there is a big demand for some better anti-cheat. Only if we had some better protection for people that leave the game early. So this one's pretty simple yet unknown. So apparently sometimes in Piranha Pit in Splatoon 2, you can actually see the great zapfish swimming around, which I've never seen it before, but I've also never looked out for it because this is the first time I'm hearing of it. But yeah, that's pretty cool. The Rocket game mode was a cut ranked game mode that was cut because it played too much like tower control. So a rocket would spawn in the middle of the map and a team would have to shoot at it to get it to move towards the other person's map. It's basically just like tower control so we're not missing much with it not being in game. So I couldn't find much on Jumping Guy and Hammer Guy but apparently they were cut villains or enemies in Splatoon 1's campaign. That's all I could really find on them. The 8-ball game mode is similar to tower control and the cut rocket game mode, whereas an 8-ball would spawn in the middle of the map, and you'd have to try to get the 8-ball into the other team's spot. And if you've ever played the 8-ball missions in Octo Expansion, thank god this mode was cut. Just imagine the 8-ball rank mode 
but without the peaceful music that plays in Octo expansion, and everyone's just trying to fight over it. That would literally be a nightmare and the ball would stay in the corner the entire game. Lil Judd is Judd's clone, and we can see this in Sunken Scroll 27, where it talks about how the professor left Judd with a cloning machine, which Judd ended up using and created Lil Judd. Octo Samurai is a fan of Kali is actually canon and stated in The Art of Splatoon 2, which says that Octo Samurai is a fan of Kali. Um, do what you want with this information. Playable Octoling's ears are actually shaped different, and this is very much intentional. So the ears are shaped differently because they're supposed to look like the fin and the siphon of an actual real life octopus, and I think that just goes to show the attention of detail put into this game. This one's really self-explanatory, so jingles from Inkopolis Plaza can be heard in New Albacore Hotel, and it's basically exactly what it sounds like, just some portions of the map in New Albacore Hotel you can hear old jingles from Splatoon 1's Inkopolis Plaza. It's kind of like a fun little nod to the old place, and this isn't the only situation where jingles from other parts of the game are referenced in different places. For example, you can hear Maritime Memory play in Inkopolis Square in Splatoon 2, right by the hat store. Splatoon 1 playable Octolings is exactly what it sounds like, but there's really a lot of depth to this. So, people were able to mod the Splatoon 1 Octoling assets to a playable character, and that's where the story would normally end, except it doesn't. So later on in the later update, Nintendo allowed Octolings to wear certain gear better and use certain specials better in an update, which really didn't make any sense because Octolings were not playable normally, and if you took an Octoling online, you would get banned for it. So what's the point of that? Who knows? We've got them now. First up on the deep end is Splatoon's Tumblr page and Splatoon 1 loading screen. This may have been true at one point, but I can't find anything about it now since the Tumblr page was updated for Splatoon 2. Next is Inner Agent 3 does not have an ink tank in Octo Expansion, which I actually didn't notice at first, but now hearing about it, wow, that's true. Um, do what you want with this? I don't know, uh whether this is going to have some lore implications at one day, but as of right now, nothing is uh, really going to come from this, so yeah. So this one actually taught me something new. Amasa's Shellendor is Sheldon's grandfather, who fought alongside Captain Cuttlefish in the Squidbeak Splatoon during the Great Turf War, and he is responsible for making the weapons Custom Splattershot Jr., Kelp Splat Charger, Aerospray MG, New Squiffer, Dynamo Roller, Gold Dynamo Roller, Hero Charger, Hero Roller, and Hero Shot. We don't know if he's alive or not because his current location is unknown. He's never once been seen before in game. I hope we get to see him one day because seeing another great turf war veteran would be pretty cool and I'd like to see the interactions we'd get with them. The Exorcist ability was a cut ability from Splatoon 2 that would have increased respawn time and special gauge spawn penalty for you and any player who splats you. Uh, I can see why this has gotten cut, because this can really be problematic when playing against people, like, this would just end up punishing you for getting a kill on someone, and that doesn't really sound rewarding, and I can definitely see that turning people away, so it definitely makes more sense as to why it was cut. The Egg vs. Omelette Splatfest isn't actually a real Splatfest, so during data mining Splatoon 2, there was a Splatfest dummy image of an egg and an omelette pitted against each other with green and pink colors. So what I really think this is is just test files for how a Splatoon 2 Splatfest would work, although the design of it looks a lot more like a Splatoon 1 Splatfest than a Splatoon 2 Splatfest. I'm not doing this one. I'm not doing it. <laughs> if you want to research it, there's actually a video on this, and I will leave it in the description, but I'm not going over this one. 
So the idea that Callie Marie are actually cuttlefish rather than squids is a theory proposed at first by, I believe, Loxton and Ganache. And basically in this theory, it goes over how Callie Marie and Captain Cuttlefish all talk about how they have bones, yet squids don't really have any bones, so maybe they're actually cuttlefish? And their ear shape and size doesn't actually seem to make sense compared to what inklings are, and they look a lot more like cuttlefish do in real life, so maybe Callie and Marie are actually cuttlefish. I don't know, it's a really cool theory, and I recommend checking out the video. MSN 109 is this ungodly horrifying mask that was made to look like the Anelia statue from Octo Expansion, and it was a reward if you had beaten it, and I don't think this needs an explanation as to why it was cut from the game, because this is horrifying, and I can't really, I don't really want to imagine running up to someone in a battle and seeing them wearing this thing. This is, uh, yeah, it's something. So this is the first one I actually couldn't find anything on, so no Inkopolis Plaza on Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is something I just couldn't find anything on, but the name sounds pretty self-explanatory, so if I had to guess, it's that um, Inkopolis Plaza isn't viewable in the Urchin Underpass map on Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Chum can be kept as pets is a strange image that comes from the Nintendo Switch Online app in the Splatoon section, where if you ink a certain amount of ink to get the Central Park stamp, one of the pictures shows an inkling holding a chum salmonoid on a leash, and it is one of the strangest things I have ever seen, and I don't want to see what people in the community are going to make out of this. So Kraken in Splatoon 2 isn't exactly a real thing by itself, but there's a really cool mod video of someone who ported the Splatoon 1 Kraken into Splatoon 2, and it looks, plays, and feels really nice. So, I'll link the video in the description. It's really cool. It's just the Kraken in Splatoon 2 doing Splatoon 2 things. That's really it, but it's really cool, and I really wish that this special didn't get removed, because it's one of my favorites from Splatoon 1. The answer to Kid vs. Squid is probably just a joke question because that's the whole marketing scheme for Splatoon. Are you a kid or are you a squid? And to answer that, there's a game theory video on it, but if you don't want to go and watch game theory, the answer is you're a squid. You evolved from a squid and being a kid is just something you get to do. So yeah, I basically just saved you from like 15 minutes of rambling there. Daigasso Band Brothers P Contest was a contest held in the game Daigasso Band Brothers P, a Japanese exclusive music game from what I'm aware of, where people would submit remixes of Octotune songs and have them featured in game. There's not a whole lot to this one besides the fact that it's just a really cool music contest and it was a way to celebrate Splatoon 2 Octo Expansion while it was coming out. With that being said, that is the end of this part of the Splatoon Iceberg, and I will see you guys back again in a few days where we will do part 3. Leave a like, please comment, and subscribe, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.